Kreuzo and welcome. Bendition and blessings. Today I would like to take you on a little journey. But it's more of a journey of imagination of your own mind. It's not going to be quite like a journey that you're used to. Let's begin. This is the nadir of the story of Caledwin. I want you to see in your mind's eye a rocky shoreline with pebbles and great boulders of grey stone. I ask you to see in your mind's eye a lake deep and dark surrounded on all sides by mountains. And in the lake that is so still that everything around it is reflected in it, there is a small island and on the island there is a keep or a castle, whatever you like to call it. And it has four towers. And from the front, great gates of oak, in front of which two guardians stand. There is a wooden bridge. Imagine this bridge as a connection between the human world and the other world. It is the dawn of the day. A young man stands in front of the great doors, the great oak gates of Castell Teged. The lake lies still all around it, Plin Teged, named for the man that owns that land. And the young man ignores the great guardians behind him who stand still and watchful. He, however, is walking back and forth in agitation. Come closer and look at this young man. His clothes are very fine. He's dressed in black and gold. The sword on his side is great and powerful. And in his strides, you see the strength of his body. This is a warrior, a trained fighter, a guardian and protector of the realm. And you look further up and at first, your eyes seem to be confused by what they take in because you expect a normal human face to be above the fine clothes. Suspend your disbelief. The face of the young man is covered with black hair, bristles that grow from every pore. And when you look down to the hands that hold the sword hilt, you can see the black bristles there. And in his face shine a pair of very bright, fine eyes. And they are as dark and as mysterious as the lake around him. The young man's face is calm, but his steps betray the worry that he holds in his heart. He keeps stepping onto the bridge and looking out onto the shoreline, muttering to himself, where can she be? She hasn't been home in three days. What can have happened to her in the realm that she rules? No one would dare attack her. No one ever has. She is a mighty witch, a mighty magician. Who would dare 
to touch the physical body of his mother, Caridwen, the ruler of this land. She is so confident that no one will ever have the courage to attack her, that she never takes any guardians with her. Again, he steps onto the bridge and he walks down a little bit to see a get better view of the shoreline on which mighty oaks stand and alders and their branches sway back and forth in the wind. The green is almost impenetrable. The sun shines brightly now on the lake. It is becoming warm. And the young man seems to have made his mind up to go looking for the person he seeks. And then in the distance, he sees a figure and he sighs a breath of relief. She just got lost in her work. She must have found something very special. She must have brewed a special medicine for someone. And he watches her approach. And as she comes nearer, his face becomes worried. And he steps further onto the bridge walking swiftly down with great steps. The figure comes closer and closer and you can see her sway. The long black hair is tangled with branches, twigs and leaves. Her face is dirty and through the dirt from her eyes are rivulets of moisture. As he comes closer, he sees that her shoes are broken. They have big holes. Her dress is ripped and torn. He is really worried now. She walks bent over, stooped, like she is many years older than her actual age. She seems like an old bent woman to him. And her gait, her steps are dragging. He comes onto, onto her. Mother, what happened? Who has done this to you? Who has dared to harm you? What is happening? Why do you look like this? Where have you been? And a tired hand waves his questions away. Her lips are brittle. They're dry. And her voice sounds cracked when she says, Help me to my chamber, son. Just help me to my chamber. And he places a gentle arm around the waist of the tall woman and puts his, her arm around his neck and supports her as they walk. The guards rush up and help him, but she waves them away as well. Do your duty, she hisses. Don't mind me and don't speak of what you see here. There is some of that old strength in her voice. Onwards they walk slowly and he half carries her by the time they reach the great oak doors. The guards open them swiftly and he steps into the great hall of the keep. The servants busy laying the tables, cleaning, stop 
and stare. And he imperiously waves two of the women. Help us. The women bustle up. They try to take his mother from his arms, but they're not strong enough to hold her. She bites her lip so hard that it bleeds and he fears that she is injured somewhere that he cannot see. I'm sorry, mother, he says, but you need your rest. And he sweeps the figure into his arms and he walks swiftly up the stairs into the keep's tower. And he deposits his mother gently onto her bed. The women follow. They take off the broken shoes. They peel back the stockings from the bleeding feet. They tusk and rush to wash the feet and put ointment on them. Blisters burst. And they put bandages around the feet. They take the dress off carefully, ripping and shredding, making sure that nothing is left and nothing touches her skin. Abakthi turns away. The women wipe the face. They untangle the hair. They place a new garment on her. They wash the hands gently. Broken nails, scratches, cuts. Her hands look awful. They place deep green ointment, thick, and then they wrap bandages gently around the hands. They gently place her firmer into the bed and cover her. When they're ready, one of them taps Abakthi on the shoulders. Master, she's ready for you. And he goes and sits by his mother's side on a stool that the women have brought. And he gently takes her ha broken hands, her bandaged hands into his hand. Mother, will you not tell me what happened? Are we under attack? Do I need to send the men out to search for whoever did this to you? Mother, hear me. Mother, can you hear me? Her eyes are closed. And after a while, he speaks again. Mother, we must protect the realm. Tell me where you've been. Tell me where you've been attacked. Caradwen opens her eyes. There are no enemies in the land but me. There is no danger in the land except for me. Abakthi is perturbed. Is she speaking in a fever? He places his hands gently on her brow but she seems cool to his touch. Mother, I don't understand the sense of what you're saying. Can you explain to me? She says, there is no one to fight, son, except the evil that lies within us. I have done wrong. I have done wrong. Abakthi sh shakes his hand. This is his proud, strong, courageous mother. Surely she has never done wrong. 
She is a healer. She is a magic woman. She has only ever used her, her power for good. How can she suddenly say that she is evil? After a while, she, he realizes she's gone to sleep. And as he leaves the room, he instructs the women to not let Carradon out of their sight and to try and get some broth into her, healing broth, brewed by her own hands for all the people she's always helped. He is at a loss to explain what has happened to her. He will find his father. He will find his father somewhere in the land and report what has happened to him. And as he leaves the room and walks down the corridor, another figure appears, radiant, beautiful, young, vibrant, so different from what happened to his mother. Kraerwi, Huayr, Badohama. Our mother is sick. She has returned, Kraerwi shouts. In astonishment and happiness, You should not be joyful. You have not seen her yet. I cannot explain what has happened to her. She says there is no enemy to fight. Kraerwi, you must go and see our mother. Stay with her. Take care of her. Look after her. I'm really worried. I am going to ride out and find father and the other men. Even if there is no enemy to fight, they must know what has happened. They must become aware of what and how she has come back. Something bad has happened. Try to get her to tell you what happened. But first and foremost, make sure that the women may heal her, that she stays in bed and that she doesn't start busying herself with things that others can do. I am no healer like you, sister, but I know that she needs her rest and she needs to recover. Allow her not to stand. Allow her not to do anything but rest until I have come back. Kwaravi very gently places her hands around her brother's shoulders. She has never seen him so shaken. And she promises to keep their mother safe. Whatever may come. Thank you, sister. Thank you. And goodbye. Turning from the realm, seeing nothing but the lake before you. This is the nadir of the story. This is the place where Caradwen suffers the consequences of what she has done in her rage and anger. She believes that she has killed Guion. She believes that she has caused the death of another being. And for a healer, as much as for a goddess, there is no greater evil than harming someone that you're meant to be protecting. 
this is the place that we come to when we are not in complete and utter harmony with ourselves and the world around us. There are a lot of people out there right now that are really suffering and they're bringing a deep conflict into the world. One of the reasons why I love Carolyn so much is that she understands us. She understands when we do not act in the best interest of everyone, then we, when we don't act to our fullest potential of good. She is a goddess that has felt what it's like to have fallen. She is a goddess that knows what it's like when we are ashamed of ourselves for having done something that is actually against what we believe in. Some of my words will feel like arrows in your breasts. Some of you, my words may hurt your heart. But there's no way other than through the darkness into the light. We have to admit to ourselves when we have done wrong, when we have reacted rather than responded, when we have allowed the arrow of anger and so sorrow into our hearts. <clears throat> when we are honest with each other, when we forgive ourselves, when we talk to ourselves in the way that at the moment, Oponopono tells us to, but I'm sure that this was something that we have done to ourselves and for ourselves for a long time. When we forgive ourselves, when we truly love ourselves for who we are, when we thank ourselves for the courage that we have every day, for all the good things that we can create, Those are the times when we are truly in our priest self, in our sacred self, when we can feel the divine connection with Goddess. It's an interesting part of the story. It's the part of the story that a lot of people want to just gel over. But it is a, a, a tale of caution for us. Carolyn's story has a myriad of facets of wisdom for all of us. So give yourself time to think, what is it that I want to create in the world? How can I do better? When you pull out anger and rage by the root out of your heart, when you allow it to return and can't be composted into the earth. When you forgive yourself for all the situations you have created that may not have been to the greatest good of whoever was present in the situation. When you have spoken harsh words, when you have done something that you're not proud of, these are all times now that we forgive. Today is another day, tomorrow is a new day. And all we can do is be better, do better. We know now where the shadow lies. We now know how we have to heal ourselves. Oponopono is about conflict. And there is far too much conflict in the world right now. There are people who are actually setting out deliberately to cause more divisiveness and more conflict. It's an awakeness, an awareness of where that might be, where you might see that happening. And first and foremost, our job is not to become involved, not to become embroiled, in that situation. We stand and observe. We don't judge. 
we don't collude we find our inner center we find our peace we find our priestess self and we connect with goddess and then we're silent if there's nothing to say that will help the situation i wish you the the best in this season it is a wonderful time of unfolding keep the faith keep going keep singing the songs keep drumming your drum keep speaking to the trees hold your crystals hold them safe to you i beg you to find a way to be happy because you can even in this difficult time take care of yourselves and take care of each other blessed be